Hello and good morning. It's good to have you with us. I'm Bob Rogers, Executive Director of the Coastside Land Trust. As the new Executive Director, I would like to welcome you to the Coastside Land Trust free community webinar series. The Coastside Land Trust is dedicated to the preservation, protection, and enhancement of the open space environment, including the natural, scenic, recreational, cultural, historical, and agricultural resources of Half Moon Bay and the San Mateo County Coast for present and future generations. We are a nonprofit organization working hard since 1997 to safeguard our scenic bluffs, open space, stream corridors, and agricultural lands from the southern city limits of Half Moon Bay north through the community of Montera in San Mateo County. We take a strategic approach to land conservation. We protect land by purchasing and accepting donations of land and conservation easements. We secure private and public funding for land conservation. We provide assistance and resources to landowners interested in protecting their land. And we lead conservation, restoration, stewardship, and educational activities. And every day we remain dedicated to protecting our coastline and our future. As members of our community and valued Coastside Land Trust supporters, we ask you to make choices that support our organization and our important work. This can be done by donating through our website. Other easy ways to donate are through planned giving of assets through land, through wills and living trusts, vehicle donation, gifts of stock, or tribute gifts, also showing up for work days and passing along our message and our mission. The important part here is that we all do our part in whatever way we can to protect and steward our shared open spaces. So thank you for joining us here today. And it's my pleasure to turn it over to Kate Dickey, our social media coordinator, to tell you a little bit about our presenter. Kate? Thanks, Bob. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, thank you, Dr. Pelosa, for making this time. Um, it is our hope that this series will allow you and all of us to learn from a breadth of esteemed and relevant vantage points geared to educating us about the living world and our connection to it um, so that we can make choices to support and care for the environment on local and global levels. Um, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce Dr. Pedro Peloso today. Um, he is a Brazilian biologist and nature photographer with a passion for wildlife and wild places. Um, he's a research associate and adjunct professor of biology at Cal Poly Humboldt, um, who's recently made this move from Brazil. Um, also a research associate for the American Museum of Natural History and uh, National Geographic Explorer. He's got a PhD in comparative biology, um, and he studies the diversity and evolutionary history of amphibians and reptiles around the world with focus on the documentation of new, rare, and threatened species. Um, he's published dozens of scientific papers and articles and a range of magazines and websites, participated in a large number of scientific expeditions to document biodiversity worldwide, um, including in South America and Southeast Asia and India. And he's going to be sharing all this with you um, in this presentation. Um, he has worked in the discovery and the naming of many new species as well. So um, it, today will be a chance for Dr. Pelosa to share his photographic work with us um, and to discuss how the research coupled with his photographic documentation of biodiversity worldwide translates into conservation initiatives. Um, before we begin, just a couple of ground rules. We'll ask that if you have questions along the way, we hope you do. This is a great opportunity to ask um, uh, to ask questions. Um, please do type those into the Q&A section. At the end of the webinar, we'll have about um, 15 to 20 minutes where we can answer those questions and as many questions as we can get to, we'll get to. Um, so that's a great opportunity. Um, we hope you enjoy this presentation and that this gives you a chance to, um, uh, to gain a, a greater awareness through Dr. Peloso's studies. So um, without further ado, Dr. Peloso, are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Kate and Bob and the uh, Trust for inviting me for this talk. And as you mentioned, I will be talking about my work in uh, documentation of biodiversity. And a lot of it will be focused on my photography work, but on, uh, on, on also on all my efforts to uh, 
uh, to conservation and especially of conservation of amphibians in the tropics. So I will start sharing my screens and this is me. Uh, I'll just give a brief introduction of who I am. I am a photographer and a biologist. Sometimes I am a biologist with a camera and sometimes I am a photographer with a background in biology. And that's important to say because this is how it always been. And sometimes in the past, I was more focused on my biology part of, of, of the work, being in the field, being the biologist working on with the diversity of amphibians and reptiles. And, and, and then I shifted towards being more of a photographer. And then I kind of merged that all into my, my projects that I uh, conduct and lead now. So just as a little bit of background, I am from Brazil. And these are some of the landscapes that I am privileged to see and have worked in the past. So I've worked on uh, coastal, coastal areas, uh, mountain areas in, in the Atlantic forest, isolated islands on the ocean. I've been camping on these islands for, for field work. High up in the Andes, I'm more interested in the Amazonian slopes of the Andes. I've done some work there. And then the Amazonian lowlands, and especially in Brazil, that's where most of my past work has been concentrated in the past few years. So I've been working with uh, amphibians in the Amazon for about 15 years now. And for a long, long time, I, I have always been interested in photography and I wanted to study you know, lizards when I got into biology. And this is one of the very first photographs I took when I got a, a slightly better equipment. So this photo is almost uh, 20 years old and it's from a lizard that I photographed when I was still an undergrad. And then my passion developed and I, I, I'm interested in all sorts of creatures and I try to take pictures and show these pictures to people. And what I try to do with these images is show these animals in a different kind of way, not just like, like a profile, regular picture. So I try to get people actually interested in these animals and wanting to lo uh, know a little bit more about them. And of course, I got interested in weird creatures such as amphibians and reptiles. I'm a herpetologist by training. And, uh, and I'm interested in rare and endangered species a lot more. So this is a viper that is only present in a single island off the coast of Brazil that I was privileged to photograph uh, some time ago. This is another example. This could be considered the most, uh, uh, the rarest and most highly endangered species of toucan we have in South America. And this is, high up in the Andes. So we went for an expedition to photograph a squirrel and I was lucky enough to see this toucan there and also the Andean bear. So these are all endangered species. And uh, one of the perks of my, of my job and my career is that I get to get pretty close to these animals and, and sometimes probably way too close. So this bear came closer than I was expecting to a point where I had to actually stand up and start talking to him so he would back off a little bit. A, 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 an ugly side of doing a lot of field work in these places is that we see a lot of destruction of habitats too. So I, I don't only see the beautiful things like these animals and biodiversity. I always I also see stuff like this. So illegal deforestation, and I've seen this in all sorts of habitats in Brazil. And uh, legal mining uh, sometimes, but this is mining, for example. There's a species that only lives in these mountain tops right there where they're mining. So the species there are becoming endangered. Illegal gold mining. And this is something that's going on uh, in a lot of places in the Amazon, especially, but uh, especially in, in Peru and Brazil. And the extent of the destruction that we are able to see is very impacting. So this is a photo I took while flying over the Kayapó indigenous territory in Brazil. 
So if you see right about the center of the image, there's a river, and that river is the limit between the Kayapa indigenous territory and, uh, and unprotected area. And I will leave you to guess which one is the indigenous territory and which one is uh, not. So anytime you see uh, things like that, it's very impactful, especially for a biologist interested in protection of forests and interested in biodiversity. So one of the things we have to do, and one of the things I feel it's my duty to do, because I have this uh, opportunity and I have this very important tool in hand, which is photography, is to show people uh, these things, show both biodiversity and show the impact that we're causing in, in, in the planet. So I use my photography as the tool to showcase that, because I am privileged to see all of this very rare biodiversity that not a lot of people get to see. So I feel it's my duty to share that. But I can also use my photography work to call for uh, to call the attention of people to some of these problems as well. So in the next few minutes, I will share a little bit of how I got into studying frogs. Uh, you know my background already. I'm a biologist from Brazil. And then what I do with frogs, uh, mostly discovering species and, and, and naming species, and then uh, how I combine my biology work with my artwork in conservation photography. The reason I got interested in, in amphibians, it's quite obvious. They're one of the most amazing animals in the planet. There are almost uh, over eight 8,500 species in the planet. They are nocturnal creatures, most of them. So I got to be outside in the forest at night seeing these animals, which is uh, amazing. Uh, the world at night in the forest is completely different. The perspective is different. The sound is different. And you, you only have your flashlight to focus on these things. So you can really focus on the moment and enjoy like the little beauty of each one of these animals and these are all photos i took from amphibians uh in brazil so this is a lot of our biodiversity there just showcased in a single slide I started working with amphibians pretty early when I was still an undergraduate and I was just pretty much curious. I didn't have any formal training in herpetologists. I was just one another herper. So I would go to the field, uh, initially interested in, in lizards and squamates, but I was finding these frogs that I did not know how to identify. And we're talking about 20 years ago in Brazil and there were very little information about these animals, no field guides. So I just have to go get these animals and then go to the primary literature and see and try to identify what I was dealing with. So this is one of the first frogs that I collected that I had no idea what it was. And when I went to the primary literature, I discovered it has just been named two years before I found it. So I was that, that was my first uh, like insight as, a, oh, wow, they're still actually discovering new things right about where I am. So this was pretty much in my backyard. So my family had a, a house in the mountains and this was like in a small uh, small creek just behind our house. In that same creek, I found this other tiny frog, uh, a small tree frog. And it happened that this frog had not been seen in over 20 years. So I found this uh, frog 20 years after its discovery and the original creek where it was uh, first discovered and named from, it, it was gone. So we weren't sure where the species was distributed and all that. So that was my first actual important finding. And I published a small uh, note on a scientific journal and I was pretty happy as an undergrad to see, to see that. And then this very tiny frog happened in my life. And I will drink some water while you try to read that quote there. And 
And the reason that quote is there is that Neil Shubin talks about how we plan things one way and then you go out to study and things happen another way. So I was interested in studying lizards and my first small project was with lizard ecology, but I was finding all these interesting amphibians, all these interesting frogs. And I found this very tiny frog and I showed it to my professor, he didn't know what it was. And we contacted other uh, amphibian specialists in Brazil. And it turned out this was an unnamed species. So still as an undergraduate student, like my third or fourth year, we found this animal and it was a new species. And it was my first major discovery. And, and I show you the smallest discovery before the, the, the short impact. And this was the first major thing. This is a new species that I got to name and I got to choose the name and was the first discoverer. Since then, I have pretty much fallen in love with amphibians for good. And I still do a little bit of work with other groups, including lizards, but the chunk of my, my master thesis, the whole of my PhD thesis, and all of my, my, my research is pretty much focused on amphibians. And again, I still carry my camera everywhere I go, and I'll just scroll over a few pictures I've taken over years of field work in South America and elsewhere. And if, if you see these pictures, you can see that I, I'm trying to, uh, again, show these animals in the field in a different perspective, doing whatever they're doing. So these are, this is a mating couple and, and they're making a little bubble nest where they lay their eggs there. This is a very interesting species that only lives inside bromeliads, which are plants that are very common in Brazil. So I'm trying to like show it where it actually lives. And if you observe enough and you're in the field enough, you get to see stuff like that. So when I saw this frog trying to eat this grasshopper, which was huge, I thought there's no way he's gonna manage to eat all of this grasshopper. But then I waited and I waited and it was like really trying hard to eat this animal. And that was pretty cool to see. And this is things that experience and, and age taught me. So in the, for, in, in the beginning, I was almost always like getting the frog and getting it and put it in a bag, trying to understand as soon as possible what it was, mostly focused in, in taxonomy. But then as a photographer and as a biologist interested in natural history, I started to take my time to understand what they were doing and, and the pictures got better too. And again, the reason why amphibians are so special. So this is a tadpole that develops on top of rocks. So it's not the regular tadpole that develops uh, underwater like most of our species here in North America. In, in, in the tropics, we have a lot of diversity of where, for example, these species lay their eggs. This is a glass frog taking care of their eggs that they put on leaves, and then the tadpoles start to develop there, and then they jump into the water. So these are all strategies to get their eggs protected and avoid competition with the, the huge diversity of species that they have around. And this is another thing that is not common here. It's common for salamanders, but not for amphibian, for, not for frogs. So one out of five species of frogs have no tadpole phase. So what we learn in textbooks is that frogs go to the water, they lay their eggs, the tadpoles develop, and then they get out of the water. But that's not true for a fifth of the frog species. But this is actually a video and it's a pretty rare image. So I'll just try to roll. I promised Kate I would take all the videos out because sometimes they don't work, but let's just hope you're seeing what I want you to see here. It's pretty short. So it's just a video of a, a frog shaking inside the egg. And 
And again, I'm lucky. I'm from I'm from Brazil. I'm privileged. One out of seven species of amphibians occur in Brazil. That's the most in the planet. So out of 8,600 uh, species, uh, 1,200 occur in Brazil. So that's a lot of diversity that I have to uh, work with. And that's how I made a career out of uh, amphibian biology. So a lot of my research interest is focused on systematics, which is the science of naming things and organizing things. So uh, I do some work with genetics, evolution, morphology, um, many different tools, but my main goal is to actually understand our biodiversity and, 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 and then from there on how to protect these. Recent estimates suggest that 50% of all amphibian species may still be unnamed, which means that we probably have over 10,000 species of amphibians, and a lot of them are still unknown to science. For example, this poison dart frog from Brazil, and this is a photo I took over 10 years ago, and this frog is still unnamed to these days. And we knew right then and there that this was an unnamed species. But the problem is naming a species and understanding biodiversity is very complex. And uh, one of the things, one of the numbers that I want you guys to have in mind after this talk is this. So the average time between discovering a species and actually giving it a formal scientific name is about 20 years. So a lot of people think it's a very easy and fast process. Oh, I discover a new species, let's just name it. So, and, and, and I can tell you it's not. So the average time is 20 years. And that's for most of uh, the vertebrate groups and it's true for amphibians. So the average time is 20 years. And the reason for that is that it usually involves a lot of complex uh, uh, methodology. So there, you usually need a lot of comparisons with museum species. And I've traveled uh, across several museums in the US, in South America, and in Europe. And sometimes you have to get loans and all that takes time. So you have to really convince your scientific peers that this, what you have in hand is a different species. And that may require comparison with museum specimens, or it may require uh, detailed genetic work. It might require detailed morphological work. And uh, I've done both external uh, analysis of morphological features, but also a lot of osteology, which is looking at the bones of these, these animals, not, not only the bones, but other uh, internal structures as well. And I've used fancy technology to do that, for example, with uh, CT scanning. Uh, and that has helped us understand a lot of the diversity of, of frogs across the world. So as I mentioned, my, my, my master thesis and my PhD thesis was with these, uh, these groups. And I've been working with this for a very, very long time. My contribution to our understanding of biodiversity is uh, 36 species named over the span of my career. And as I mentioned, I do most of my works with frogs. So 31 species of frogs, most of them from the Amazon, but also some lizards. And I have collaborated on the descriptions of a bird species. And I have a PhD student that is currently working on the diversity of prey mantis. And you would think that we know a lot about prey mantises and uh, the fact is that we do not. There are many, many species to be named, especially in the tropics again. And here are just some of examples, some of the, uh, some examples of the species I have helped discover our name over time. And this one is called Tendropsophus ozii. We chose this name because it has a very high high pitch call, uh, similar to a bat. And for those of you that know Ozzy Osbourne, his relationship with bats is pretty close. We can discuss this later. 
this is a species I discovered in the Amazon in 2008 or 2009. And this is probably one of the most beautiful species that I've, uh, I've had the privilege to name and describe. Most of the species, however, are these, uh, are not that beautiful uh, aesthetically. They're these tiny, small frogs that live in the leaf litter. For example, I've worked with the genus Adenomera, which is back when I started to work, we had like two species that were considered to be widespread across the Amazon. But we, uh, after analyzing advertisement calls and morphology and genetics, we, we figured out it was actually multiple species with smaller ranges. This is another species of that group. And now you will understand how this is tied to how I how I got interested in conservation and concern about uh, protecting these animals and protecting their environment. So this is a species we named, and this species was discovered in the Amazon. So I just want you to look at that tiny white arrow pretty much in the center of the map. So this is the locality where the species was discovered. And this is the, the green, of course, is the forest coverage as it was in 1985. And this is how it looks now. So we discovered that species in that tiny fragment of forest there. And all of the forest pretty much in the surrounding areas is gone. So this means that this species was probably widely distributed across those forest uh, uh, forested habitats, and it's now restricted to some of these very uh, small fragments. And this destruction was in the span of my my life, and and this is the southern part of the Amazon where we call the deforestation arc where a lot of the Amazon is being lost pretty rapidly. And of course, we're probably losing species before we get to know them. I was lucky to have found this, but I can only imagine the amount of very tiny plants or tiny insects and, and fungi species that we're losing before we even get to find them in, 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 in these places. This leads me to part three. So you know my background, you know what I did most of my career as a scientist and now how I got more, more, more and more involved in, in conservation. So four out of 10 species of amphibians are threatened with extinction globally. This makes amphibians one of the most highly endangered groups of animals worldwide. They're more in danger than mammals, than birds, than a lot of other groups. Amphibians are very, very, very sensitive to habitat alteration, to some pathogens, and to climate change. So amphibians are very, very sensitive. And this is just another reason, in addition to all that I've said, that uh, amphibians are a very, very interesting group to study. Just for clarification here, when I talk about threatened species, I'm talking about these three official categories, so vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. Extinct species is a different ballgame. So if a species is uh, considered extinct, it's no longer threatened. And if it's threatened, it's not extinct. And those are all official categories used by most uh, assessments of species threats worldwide. In Brazil, despite the very high biodiversity, we only have 61 species included in the official red list. And there are many reasons for that, which I will not discuss now, but we can discuss later if you're interested. So of these uh, 61, 59 are considered threatened and two are considered extinct. But in addition to these, we have 15 that are considered possibly extinct. So they're still in the threatened category, 
but they are likely to become considered uh, extinct. So they could be extinct, but they do not meet all the criteria that we set to consider a species uh, extinct. But we do have 15 species, at least, that are missing for a very, very long time. And this is an example, this one in the jar right there. And uh, this is the only uh, image that is possible for me today to take of this uh, species. With all that in mind, and combined with a small crisis I had after years of postdoc and not knowing what I wanted for my career and, and from being very intensely focused on research, and I had my passion for photography and I got involved with some stuff with National Geographic. So my head was exploding with ideas. And I was trying to figure out a way to combine both my interest in photography and art and my, my drive to continue my research in amphibian biology. And then all of a sudden I had this uh, eureka moment where I said, well, what if I combine these two into a project? Then uh, about five years ago, I created the Documenting Threatened Species Project. And the major idea of this project was very simple. The main idea was to, well, I'll just try to find uh, support and resources to go to the field and photograph and document all of these endangered species in Brazil. And the rationale behind that is that when I googled and searched for images of these endangered species, many of them had no images available or had only very old or very bad images available. And if you're trying to communicate and talk to the media and convince people to protect these animals, we needed better images. So I said, well, I can photograph these animals and I can make compelling images and all I need to do is just go to the field and, 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 and find them. So this was the main idea and you can, you'll see later that this branched into a much broader project right now. So as you know, Brazil is considerably large. So it is a challenge to find uh, all these pieces and to find resources to go to all these places to find these pieces. So I did find some money to do expeditions. We, so far we've made 11 expeditions and the 11th one was just completed uh, uh, last week. So it was just in Brazil in the Amazon last week for our 11th expedition. And in some of these expeditions, we focus on a single species and in some, we have several species because a lot of these species are uh, distributed in the same place. So just show you now some of the species we have photographed for the project. Not a lot of background on them, but just a little information. So this is a critically endangered species that is so far only known from a single locality. And because it is a very beautiful species with, with these like really red eyes, which are similar to the color of our logo that was designed by this artist. For me, it sort of became the symbol of, of, of this project. It is a very, very beautiful species, critically endangered with extinction. Another example of a very highly threatened species, critically endangered, only known from a single locality as well in Southern Brazil. And this is a very cool, story behind it. So one of the things we want to do is highlight the stories and highlight the people that work with these species. So this species was found in a river and so far it is only known from this small river in southern Brazil. But a uh, local energy company wanted to build a dam in this river and because of this frog and pressure from the biologists that work with it and, and conservation and NGOs we managed to stop this dam from, from being built in that river. So that is the power of a single species to change the course of development. We, we, we cannot stop development entirely, but 
these species and the importance uh, of biodiversity locally can have a major impact in, in, in political decisions like that. Another critically endangered species only known from small creeks inside a city. So this is a very urban species. It's doing well within the city, which is in the kind of a veil. Uh, it only occurs there. Another species that is only present in a single creek in a single island off the coast of Brazil. So this is very probably probably one of the most, the rarest, most highly endangered species that we have in Brazil. This is another species from that same island, but it's a little bit more broadly distributed throughout the island. And again, just using these frogs with Brazilian symbols showing the importance of the animals and the photography as an art to call your attention. So if you look at this picture, you know it's from Brazil because of the coin and, and, and it's shining silver. So it, it, it's sort of portrayed as a jewel of our biodiversity there. I just put this, that one there. This is a species of salamander. We do not have a lot of salamanders. So we, in Brazil, we brag a lot about being the most diverse uh, country in terms of biodiversity in most groups, but that is not true for salamanders. We only have four salamanders in Brazil. And if I take a hike pretty much wherever I go here in California, I if I pay attention, I'm likely to see maybe more species than we have in all of Brazil. So you 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 guys, well, now that I'm here too, we are lucky to have such a, an amazing diversity of salamanders here. And one of the things we try to do after every one of these expeditions at, and every once in a while is communicate about these species. And now that I have the images to do so, I can, put these species into a spotlight in magazines, in journals, or, or and, and put them on the, the cover of magazines, so in, in semi-technical or in popular press. And we've been pretty successful with that. And that has helped a lot the local communities to get more support for their conservation projects and, and highlight their unique species that each of these cities have. And as I mentioned, we have broadened the scope of the project a little bit. So this is one of the species that was initially in the list. So we just had the idea to go there and photograph. But now we have a, a $100,000 project to um, actually monitor the species, where it happens, where it occurs. And we have a, a team of biologists trying to search for the species in other habitats to better assess the actual level of threat of these species. So we have a project focused on that species that branched from my documenting threatened species project. And this is also true for the harlequin toads. And as I mentioned, I was in Brazil last week. So this is Atlopus manauensis, the Manaus harlequin toad. And this photo is from last week. And this is another example of how we have branched our project. So the DOTS project is now part of the Atlopus Survival Initiative, which is an initiative that is involves scientists globally. So we have over 50 people from several institutions, all focused on the conservation of harlequin toads, because within amphibians, harlequin toads are the most endangered, like 80% uh, of the species are threatened with extinction for various reasons. So that is a focus of our documenting threatened species project from the documentation point of it, but we also have other initiatives that help with the conservation of this, this animal. And here is an example of how all of this is tied. And I'm sorry that the slide here is in Portuguese. I overlooked this, but this is the species I mentioned right in the beginning. It was my first contact with the hardcore taxonomic science. So I discovered the species in 2005. It was formally named in 2012. 
So it didn't take 20 years, but it did take a while. And then in two, 2014, this species, the species was listed as critically endangered with extinction. So this is another example, and I've mentioned one before, of a species that I have discovered, and it's in pretty bad shape in terms of conservation. So we went back two years ago to the place where I have discovered the species when I was an undergraduate student, and we did the whole documentation of the place. And this is Sylvia Pavan. Uh, she's the curator of uh, the Vertebrae Museum here at Cal Poly Humboldt, and uh, my wife and partner in a lot of adventures, including going to the field. And she's looking to find that tiny frog there in the field. And I know I should be sort of helping find, but I need to document. And I had to take this photo of her searching for the frog. And I did help after that. So we did find this animal. And once again, we put them, we put uh, that photo that I took on the cover of many, many different uh, uh, outlets, including BBC Brazil and National Geographic. And now we are uh, on the process of trying to get funds to better study this species and help protect it a little bit more. So we're working with, in partnership. We have a team in Brazil that is working in partnership with parks, with the government to try to uh, amplify uh, conservation initiatives with uh, this species. As you've probably figured by now, we do a lot of research. And one of the things we have done in the past is to look for pathogens in the species that we collect in the field. And we have uh, published papers on uh, diversity of bacteria and diversity of pathogens and how they are related. And we have used data on all of these endangered species that I found uh, that I find in the field to compile a bigger data set and we compare for example this data set with a Malagasy data set that's available and we trying to reach broader more impactful conclusions on on what's going on with amphibian declines uh, worldwide. This is uh, Werther, a friend of ours and a partner of the project, and he's uh, setting up uh, uh, recorders to monitor that species that I mentioned from, from the Cejado, so the, the rocket frog. So he's kind of leading the species monitoring using uh, acoustic monitoring. So, so, so we know when the species is active, we're trying to search in places where it seems to be lost and, and um, all kinds of different initiatives that we're doing with that, with that frog. We continue to do field work for research and not only photographs. And this is in Colombia, part of the Amphibial Survival Initiative um, project. I try to always highlight the researchers and the scientists working on the conservation of species locally, and I'm open to collaborations with them, trying to find more money and try to find funds for them to work with these species. And we've been pretty successful in at least establishing some partnerships with these people. So I am interested in going there and photographing the frogs. That's one thing, but we're also interested in building broader alliances for the conservation of amphibians in Brazil. Uh, local communities, we, we, we have been able to teach uh, local students and local communities the importance of these frogs and, and, and the importance of our work as well. Education is a key aspect of conservation and we love to work with uh, young kids. And some of the things that we've done in the past is write uh, pamphlets. And we also wrote a book. And this is all related to the uh, Atlopos Survival Initiative. And so we wrote a book that we distributed in, in schools in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Peru, and uh, and uh, other countries, I don't remember all of them, but we distributed this book for free in a lot of the schools. Talks, of course, and whenever we go to school and we have books, we 
give out the books and we talk to kids, we talk to young adults, we talk to older adults, we try to talk to all sorts of different crowds to showcase the importance of amphibian conservation, not only in Brazil, in South America, but globally. So this is just an initiative within the book. So it's very kid friendly. So we added uh, images of the frogs so they can color and learn about the biology of these frogs and the importance of conservation at the same time. We do workshops, make t-shirts, we make posters. We really try to engage the, the, the people with these, with these animals so they can remember these experiences for a while. As you probably know, engaging people in conservation is not easy, and but th there are ways to do it. And I think one of the key aspects is to expand beyond laboratories. So we've done quite a few initiatives. We have an exhibit, for example, where we that we helped develop in the Museu Gildi in Brazil, which is the largest museum in the Brazilian Amazon one of the oldest uh, research institutions where they have a public exhibit. And we did set up a whole exhibit about the Amazon and about uh, night in the Amazon focused on uh, less known creatures such as frogs and insects and, and stuff like that. And this has been seen by thousands of people uh, so far. For the uh, uh, Harlequin Toads initiative, we also partnered with some artists uh, that uh, create help create four songs for one frog from each species. So we selected four species that are iconical from each of the countries and they develop songs and we did uh, video clips. And one of the ways in which people can support our project and support these artists is to just listening to these musics and, and, and sharing it with people. Um, I have put here, uh, for example, this is the species that I just photographed in Manaus last week, but we had the whole campaign and one of the songs made in Portuguese after this animal. And just sharing this with people is, is a way to contribute so that more people know about these frogs. So it's been seen uh, quite a few times already. And just supporting the artists would be a great way to help. As I mentioned, we have partnered with several artists in different initiatives. Just briefly here, uh, an artist painted a, a, made this painting and part of the profits from that was donated for the concert for a conservation project. The same with a t-shirt on the right, part of the profit was donated. And an, an another aspect that is scalable and doable anywhere is citizen science. So one of the things that we have supported in the past is these bio blitzes where we get kids to, to learn and use, for example, the iNaturalist app. And this is where we are at a big advantage, for example, here in California. So I'll just show you some numbers that are actually pretty staggering in terms of how little we know about amphibians in, in Brazil in comparison to other places. So this is uh, my project in iNaturalist. So I automatically get information whenever people post a photo or a record of one of the species that are endangered with extinction in Brazil. And so far, we have only 134 observation of these species for 23 of those endangered species. That is very little. It is fair to say that these are rare endangered species and they're not widely distributed. A lot, a lot of people don't know about them, but it this is still very low numbers when compared to other species. So if you look at these numbers from iNaturalist, so if you look at the whole of Brazil, and this is filtered for amphibians, we have almost 22,000 observations of amphibian uh, species in Brazil for 764 species. 
But if you look at amphibians in California, you have over 150,000 observations, and that's for less species, which means, which means you have a lot more people observing and seeing and posting for less species, which means you can get a lot better information from, from these kinds of, uh, uh, of databases. And this only includes research grade observations, which are more usable in, in, in research in some ways. So for our documenting threatened species project for, for the endangered species that I filter, the most observed species is Melanophoniscus dorsalis, which is interesting because we did an expedition to find this species and we did not find it in the field for some reason. And because we have so little uh, observations, the data that we can derive from that is very limited. In comparison, with California, and this is not endangered species, you have over 21,000 observations for the most observed species, which is the California new. And you have a much more precise, for example, data on an annual distribution for these species. And if you remember the previous slide, 21,000 observations is almost the same number of observations that we have for all of amphibians in Brazil. So this is a very contrasting difference of, of knowledge and interest of the general public in using this sort of, uh, applic uh, of apps and sharing this information. That doesn't mean that every, we know everything about all of the frogs. So this is from iNaturalist as well, and the numbers might be very small. So these are all amphibians that supposedly occur in California, and I do not have 100% certainty that they do, and they might just be misidentifications. But these are observations filter for amphibians in California that have less than 25 observations. So there are still things we need to figure out. We need to figure out if these are poorly identified tax or they're just poorly known taxa. And if you go down this list, there are very few taxa that shouldn't even be there, but there are records. So we need to figure out if they're actually introduced or what's going on. So there's a lot of information that we still need to get and derive from, from, from amphibians and citizen science and iNaturalist is a very, very good source of information and potential ideas and projects in amphibian conservation. And my main takeaway today is for everybody to keep exploring. There are many, many things that we can still do. For me, the tropics is where my, my passion is, but I am here now and I'm getting more and more interested about the local fauna. And because we're here, that, that are, there are many, many important things that we still need to see and study around. Thank you very much. I hope this was not too long. I think I managed to stay within time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. What an incredible presentation and lots of lots of questions that I think we have a couple of questions, but I, you know, the, the very first thing, I mean, thank you very much for clarifying sort of how we examine what is threatened versus extinct and sort of that, that how, you know, where, where that lies. One question that I'd love to ask you right away is the use of the tool, the iNaturalist, the Seek app, using those things. Um, you know, I'm thinking we, I, we live in Half Moon Bay. This, this is where Coast Atlantis comes from. Um, and recently they were looking for specific sea stars, right? And so they were looking to, they were giving us, you know, if you were on, you were able to, they kind of channeled some information saying, look for these specific mm -hmm. sea stars, get on the, and you can log these and these are helpful for us. Are there ways for us or, or specific avenues that we can be ex sort of cueing the, the general public into species of specific concern so that we can be doing, you know, it's not just random that I'm going, oh, there's a Heerman's gull, or this is, you know, this frog, we're mm -hmm. examining what we see on our trip, but we're looking specifically to help for those species you're talking about that are really difficult to find. There, there are ways, but I feel that's one of the bottlenecks between what us scientists want as information and what the public is generating. And I think 
there's a lot of information being generated and there's a lot of interest in some things, but this communication kind of is not very well done. And I think one of the ways to do that is to find a way to get into the media and talk to the media more. And, and scientists are not trained nor interested nor In, in general, they're not interested or, or trained, and, and, and there's a lack of communication between science and media. And the reason I put that difference between threat and, and extinct is that that's one of the most often confused terms when we talk about conservation with the media. Because uh, I send a picture of an endangered species, and the, the highlight is, ah, extinct species is, is photographed in Brazil. It's It's not. And, and it's hard to change understanding of nomenclature and language that we use, but that's a very, very important distinction for conservation biologists. Mm -hmm. And if we reinforce that and talk about that all the time, especially with people that are more, that are in other areas and not into the specific details of language, that might help. Mm -hmm communication I think yeah are there ways um for us to I mean if if someone is going to be traveling to some of these areas where you've done research that they can hop onto your website and see these specific species of concern in the regions they would be in so that if they're able to or you know here in California or wherever we are that we can be kind of looking out for specific species of concern that we could be helping in that yes so well, whenever you go to to Brazil, for example, and I'm interested in the species there, and you post all of your images, there are quite a few people that are very active, and they're going to help you identify. And if they identify correctly, it'll pop up for me. Mm -hmm. Our website does not have maps of distributions yet, and that is something that we are considering if we're going to put up or not, because we have a problem with the pet trade in a lot of a lot of these beautiful endangered species in the tropics, as soon as you give too much details about where they are, mm -hmm. people go there and get them and put them on those pet trade. So some of these species only occur in a single place. And for example, they are not that difficult to find once you're in the right place. And, and, and that is something that we have to consider very carefully whether we want this information to be out there so easily mm -hmm. that makes sense. it's always a trade-off of yeah yeah right I, and we have a couple of questions but another one is when you're that process of qualifying something as extinct i mean what does that process look like to be able to actually you know qualify and and have you ever how how often has that happened where you've come back especially in your field with the amphibians where you've got well actually <laughs> sorry that's not you know like coming back from that so how does that okay so as i mentioned for describing a species it takes a long time so categorizing a species as in danger or extinct also takes time so the process is usually you get a bunch of specialists together and they get all of the information that they can on that species so distribution if you have um population size or estimates of decline and if they have data on pathogens and all that so you collect all that information and then you use a standard sort of chart and you start categorizing that within ranks or categories and depending on the outcome it's listed as threatened in one of the categories or of least concern or data deficient if you don't have enough information mm -hmm. To be listed as extinct, of course, the species must have not be seen for a while. So one of the, the key criteria is not being seen for X amount of years, which I don't remember on the top of my head. I think it might be like something between 20 and 30. But there must be evidence that it was searched enough. Because a lot of the species in Brazil, for example, are in remote places or there are in places that are now dangerous to go. So there weren't enough searches, even though you reach the time criteria, there hasn't been much enough search to 
to make sure that it was the species is extinct. Mm -hmm. One of the things is like it's is much easier to prove that something is there than it is to prove that it is not. Right. A single record can prove okay it's there, but you need years and intense searches to prove that it is not. Especially some of these species that only show up for a couple of weeks a year. Right. Yeah. yeah, for breeding, yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of them, we have no information about their biology whatsoever. So we don't know where they breed, where they are, what is the actual habitat. So you might be in the right forest, but if you're not in the right creek at the right moment, you're not going to find it. And especially with climate changes, that there can be migration. of these. They, they can be moving around, yeah. There might be, you might go there in a like dry a drought and you won't find them, but you go the next year and they're all there. And I've had this experience with many species. Like I know where they are and I go there, they're not, but you go a week later and then they are. It's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, got a few more questions. Um, so Tom was asking, uh, besides habitat loss, are there factors that make amphibians more vulnerable than other types of animals? Do you want to speak to that? Yes, one of them is uh, pathogens. There's a fungi called a fungus called uh, Batrachochytrium. It's the chytrid fungus, and it 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 is estimated that it caused the extinction of many many species all over the world. And it was discovered in Central America, but it's widespread all over the world. And this was a a a major factor in declines and and extinctions, including in very well protected areas. So there is some evidence that species that were in very nice habitats, they, they were should be fine, but then a pathogen goes there and just decimates the population. So that's a concern. And that's something that a lot of people are actively looking into to understand the dynamics of the pathogen and how it affects some species and not others. And, and it might even affect reintroduction, for example, from zoo, zoo specimens. If you put them out there and they might be all killed again, you know, mm -hmm. that's that would be the second major factor. So habitat loss and maybe pathogens. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, Tom also asked, can you talk a little bit about the equipment you use to capture your photos? Well, I, I always get that question. And because my talk spans uh, 20 years, it, it varied a lot. But 90, I would say 95% of the time is just a DSLR camera with a micro lens and an external flash. If it's a diurnal species, it changes completely. But at night, you, you need that. Because even with like artificial lighting, except from the flash, it's not that good. So it's DSLR, micro lens, 100 millimeters usually, and then a flash. And I use a lot of diffusers for the flash. Otherwise, like the the shadows get too harsh and, and, and the highlights get too highlighted. Like my window here. <laughs> all right, Rhonda Press is asking, um, how do you, you know, with all this work you're doing, how do you keep positive? How do you keep from being disheartened and depressed by the state of an amphibian extinction? It's not, it's not easy, and I always, uh, I'm optimistic in, in a way that we have a lot more people working for conservation now than we had 20 years ago, and we have a lot of resources that we didn't have some years ago, and, and one of the things that I always tell people is that the media are interested in what we're doing as scientists. Uh, we just have to talk to them and and we have to stop this thing where scientists should not talk to the media or think we're too entitled to do that and sometimes it's just fear of being misquoted because we're we we care too much about what we say and that should be conveyed right so that has nothing to do with the question but how did it's hard to be optimistic because in all honesty, we're fighting a battle that we know we're going to lose at the end because corporations in development get a lot more money than conservation for sure. So each each and every single small gain is should be taken as a positive and just just feed from that, you know. Mm. Okay. <laughs> 
update what you were saying too, and and just let's clarify this and add on to what you had said before. You were talking about, you know, the conservation starts with, you know, it's research, it's education, it's spreading that message to children, to citizens, to these conversations. What you're doing exactly right now is just get p educating people. Um, any other things you would say, you know, just to the average person, I mean, we have someone here who's asking about specific foundations to donate to and that, yes, please that, and what can we be doing? And you're saying seek, you know, getting, be, taking part in citizen science in that way, or I'm sorry, iNaturalist. Um, but are there other things just sort of on a day-to-day, -day? I mean, there's so many things that we, like the, the base level, like you as a human to protect these ecosystems to protect these animals these are the things that on a daily basis we should be really focusing in on i think we should be on a daily basis focusing on education and not only educating others but also self education on 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 where can you be effective in in changing and and for my field for example i'm going to give you a definition of what conservation photography is conservation photography aims to change people's behavior or perception of the world through photography. So nature photography would be, I photograph a frog and I show you that frog. So conservation photography will add some elements to that image and it could be just words and tell you, look, this is a very beautiful frog, but please pay attention to whatever you're throwing in the water because that frog is in the water that you're polluting. And, and that's a small example to a local population, but if we need that and we need that in a broader global scale. So it's like the key word would be education because if I want to change behavior, it's, it's only going to happen through education and others and self-education. And it takes time. And th that's the part about staying positive could a lot of people get into conservation and get frustrated or a lot of people avoid getting into conservation because they want to stay productive in academia, for example. So a lot of amphibian biologists do not want to work with conservation because it takes a lot of time and they're going to publish less papers. And that is 100% true. And I felt that and I've seen a lot of other colleagues say the same and not only in amphibians, in other animals and plants and oceans and whales if you're focusing on conservation where you have to educate you have to talk to stakeholders you have to get grants that are not going to result in in papers which is almost the single most important thing that we're evaluated in academia then then you're it's always a that trade-off so self-educating in the importance of conservation is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And you have to really think about it on a day-to-day -day basis because it takes time. And that's why working with kids is easier in a sense because you can just inflict or plant that seed now so you can see change in, in many, many years. Mm -hmm. It's harder to change behavior in fully grown up adults, but it's also important and maybe more if you want immediate impact. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered the question, just like yes, no. yes. Okay, so but Marshall <laughs> asked like a clarifying addition, I think is really important to add on to that, which is can you help sort of fill in that sense when we're saying it is like we are making the, you know, it is important for conservation. Why are we telling people it is important to save these species? What, how do you finish that sentence when you're talking to kids, when you're talking to adults, when you're photographing these, these specific amphibians and you're saying it is important to save these species because? Because every species is part of a whole and we do, we do not know what's going to happen to the whole once you start taking out these small things. If you look... If you have a, 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 let's think of a pile of things, you start taking stuff from that pile, you don't know what's going to happen, but at some point that whole pile is going to collapse and and people talk about tipping points and, and it's a big word now for Amazonia. We're past the tipping point, we're getting to the tipping point and we talk about that 
in climate change those those are all things that might happen and will happen if we do not change we and we do not fully understand the consequences and each of these species is part of a more complex environment you take out the predators for example you you have as a, an example, everybody's going to understand here in the U.S., you took off all the predators and now we have problems with white-tailed deers. Mm -hmm. And you have white-tailed deers, you have more ticks, and you have more ticks, you have Lyme disease, and that's a major problem now. So that's just one example of a broader thing. So we don't fully understand what amphibians do in the environment, but they certainly regulate something. And if they're sensitive, that's something that's going on to the environment that we might not fully understand the consequences to, but there is a consequence for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's these vulnerable indicator species, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, thank you. The uh, last question for now um, is that, uh, let's see, in this, uh, who you know found uh, so we uh, one of the questions was foundations to donate to to support and of course we would also say of course the coastal land trust because this is all of this is about preserving natural habitat right mm -hmm. and, um but are there specific foundation you would channel people to support um for amphibian research conservation to support amphibian research you can of course, go to the... as well yep there are many and and depends on what really interests you and, and and if you want to funnel that to amphibians i would say the amphibian survival alliance is a good place to start mm -hmm. they channel funds to a multitude of of projects including ours if needed and donating directly to the conservation work that i do you can talk to me and we can do it through the foundation here at the university but there are many, many ways. Uh, National Geographic has supported my work for a while, and you can donate to National Geographic, although I'm, I'm not going to see that money. But th there, there are many. So I would say amphibians, you could start with the Amphibian Survival Alliance, and I, I can connect people to the right people there and make sure that money goes to interesting projects. Um, Rewild is another foundation that is pretty interesting and we're starting to I am starting to personally work with them in the lost species program to try to search for these possibly extinct species and um, yeah there are there, 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 there are way too many the ICFC International Conservation Foundation Fund for for Canada and these are just some that I am involved with but there are there are several and if people want specifics they can maybe contact me and i can point them to the right direction thank you and you know what that's a great segue because i think we'll I, we will have a follow-up email that's coming out and thank you so much for any of the links and if, if you don't mind you know we'll we'll put your contact information yep. for people that are interested yeah, yeah yeah for sure yeah you're making an impact and and value that question um for people that are asking it out and people that are just wondering now as we're here yeah. And there are many ways like you can donate and make sure your money goes to research or it goes to education or it goes to something like what I'm doing. For example, we are hiring an intern to come here and work on a biology plus art program that we're going to try to illustrate all of these possibly extinct species and sort of like a modern paleo art like we do extinct dinosaurs but with extinct species that we have no images for so we're, we're doing that and this is done through the foundation here and we've got a generous donation that kick-started the program but that's something that could be funded for the future too so there are there are many ways to to do that and there are many many avenues of ways from small to big mm -hmm. buying land in brazil is one which is sometimes problematic because of land titles and owners ownership, but it's been done. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And thank you so much to, thank you for sticking around a little bit extra. Yes. And thank you to all of you who are sticking around to ask these questions and listen to how we can be a part of, you know, solution and a part of the, part of all of the conservation process. 
Um, I know I'm feeling really inspired as a teacher also just thinking about ways that we, that, that value of education with students is that, that beginning, that foundation of just getting them to know, to identify, to connect with the natural world and the living world. And then st- that's where the groundwork starts from, right? And that's where yeah. we kind of begin that process of all questioning that, like, now what? Now, how do we get involved? Um, and so thank you so much. Thank you for the, all of you who are here. Thank you, Dr. Peloso, so much for making time. Thank you. <laughs> And yeah, I will quickly hop off because I know where it is 11.15. People have been uh, here for a while. Um, Just a reminder, please, we will be sending out a couple of actual um, calendar things I want to remind people. We have a coastal cleanup day. So if you're wondering about ways to be involved, this is great um, opportunity. All of California coastal cleanup day this year is September 23rd. Our beach um, with Coast Land Trust will be uh, hosting a cleanup at Poplar Beach. So um, lots of information. We'll be sending out emails about that. Again, try not to unsubscribe from us because we keep it minimal, but you get this base level information. So we've got um, Coastal Cleanup Day coming um, coming up soon. We also have a Wavecrest Raptor Walk, which for anyone who's ever done this, this is with Sequoia Audubon Society. I did my first one uh, a couple of months ago. So incredible. I mean, just to have the, the you know, bringing the scopes, so you can just see so many raptors that I, you know, the the untrained eye is not used to really examining up close. So really, really a great opportunity and a wealth of knowledge from the folks that are leading these small groups. We'll be breaking people up in small groups um, so they can be doing that. But a careful observation, I learned a whole bunch in just, you know, two hours of being out in the field. Um, and then we have Raina Bell from California Academy of Science, also friend to Dr. Peloso. Um, we, she will be here in November, or we'll be doing a, a, a community webinar in November 4th. So she is the curator of herpetology at uh, Cal Academy, Cal, Cal Academy of Sciences here in San Francisco. Um, really, I mean, for those of you that this is an interest, an area of interest, she's going to be talking about um, her current research on studying the, the conservation of biological diversity. So picking up right where we left off here. Um, yeah, and um, we will, um, if you have, we will be sending out a follow-up email on Tuesday. So it class you know, within that window, we're going to be getting a little bit of information, some links to send with a follow up um, with a video too. So that idea of how can I help sharing these videos, right? Sharing these with people to learn a bit more um, is a wonderful way to get started. Um, and yeah, thank you also for being here. And we will um, see you all um, hopefully at our next webinar in November. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>